welcome to Gavin with Gavin. Hey, what's happening, everybody? Uh, welcome to, this is going to be episode four of the Gavin with Gavin podcast. I got a, <laughs> a very special guest in the studio today. He is a pioneer of Canadian mixed martial arts, a judo black belt, a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. One of the uh, one of the most important people who's ever been in my life, to be honest. And oh, jeez. I'm, I'm super happy to be joined by him today. Give it up for Justin Bruckman, everybody. Hey, that's, that's me. Hey. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't think... Uh, I didn't think we'd start crying and shit till like later on. I was gonna say, I, I was gonna ask you before, <laughs> who do you think cries first during Yeah, this? I know. Just, sorry, we'll break down together when the time's right. Don't worry. We'll get there's probably odds on it. So we'll we'll just keep guessing for now. So do you uh do you feel like I should be in charge? Are you comfortable comfortable being in charge I, around? Like how you wanna do this? It's been it's been years of it's been years of taking orders from you, really. So. All right, you got you take the lead then and I'll just run with it. Oh man, so thank you very much for joining me today. Oh, of course. Um I want to get into your whole history of martial arts. I know you've told your story a ton of times, just for anybody who's new, join us on the podcast. Yep. Um, but just let me ask you first, you have been you have been involved in martial arts now for? 24 years. 24 years. Yeah. You've got to travel the world. You've, um, you've fought guys who have fought for UFC titles, guys who have become UFC champions. Um, you've just touched tons of people's lives. Do you, do you ever think... You know, when you first walked into the gym, this was something that was ever possible for you? Um, not really. Like, I knew when I walked in and put on a gi for the first time, I knew that's uh, that's what I was going to do. I wanted to do that. Like, and I was all in on it, but I didn't. Like, this journey didn't really, like, this career and this thing that we did didn't fucking exist. Right? We made it. We kind of made it up. Like, there was not, there wasn't those opportunities and to, to travel, see the world, do all these things. Like, when I got into the mixed martial arts side of things, like, it was still like underground, like cage fighting shit. It wasn't respected. Right. So it's di it was way different than it is now. So the opportunity wasn't there. We were just doing it because I was doing it because I didn't know what else to do with myself, really. Like, so I, kn I knew I could fight. So I just like, had to learn the, you know, kind of tricks of the trade and then just go for it. And, Next thing you know, you're doing fucking podcasts. It's 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 been a crazy journey for you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. A strange and a strange and wild ride. Yeah. Um. So let's 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 tell everybody the story. March second, nineteen ninety seven. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've like, I've told it a thousand times, and I'm sure I'll tell it more. But the um, yeah, man. I I was, fuck. It was across. I was at a bar across the street, <laughs> right from here, and uh, got lit up one night. Got in a fight, and uh, I just woke up next day with a black eye and missed my ride to work at some shit job I hated anyway. And I was uh, just wandering around in the fucking slush and snow. And I, I, ha I just happened to stumble into, to the gym. Like, cause I, you know, I was out of shape and I was just lost in my life and I was just out of shape and depressed and, and uh, feeling sorry for myself. And something just kind of gave me the sign to walk into this place. And the guy convinced me to just basically I went in there. I'm like, I don't get any money but I'll help you out around here if I can train and do whatever. And he's like, why don't you try some judo out? Jumped on the judo mats, went back to another class that night. And I think literally it was the next day I went and quit my job. And I've been a career, pretty much career martial artist ever since then. No job since then. Not really like random shit here and there, but like just enough to. Amazing. Yeah. Like, a, what, cause there's no money in it. And I was working for a bit. And then if someone actually foolishly handed me a mortgage and then I like, same thing, I quit my job the next day. So, you know, they got, Okay, like, uh, like as soon as I was able to have a mortgage that some idiot gave me a mortgage, I'm like, all right, well, I quit this job too. I'll just figure it out, right? And all just all kind of fell in place. Oddly enough, what was the uh, what was that first gym? Uh, that was Kichi Side Judo Club right here in, in Whitby, and uh, pretty funny when you look at it later on in life too, because it was attached to a gym, and the gym was called God's Gym, <laughs> right? You remember that place, oh, right? And it was a strange, strange. And looking back now, that gym was incredible. Like how big and amazing, amazing. it was. Like we didn't, we didn't know how spoiled we were, because until later on when we had to do that shit ourselves, we were training and fighting in little dungeons and shit. That place was way ahead of its time. It was just mismanaged, right? That was yeah. Those were the days, man. Yeah. Um. So just to back it up a little bit. So at this point, you'd you'd gone to God's Gym, Kichi Sai. Yeah. Um, that was 97. Yeah. 
three was the first UFC. Yep. And you saw that. That's yeah. That's where I was like, oh yeah, I'm doing that. You didn't like, quite know how. Didn't quite know. No way. I, uh, what interested me in the judo is like so the baddest dudes I knew were all kind of judoka, right? So that was kind of what you know steered me in that direction of doing judo first. And there wasn't really any jiu-jitsu around quite yet, so I just started with judo, and I just kind of took it from there. Like I just just built off that. In between, uh, in between that, you seeing the UFC and actually going into the gym, had you met Tony? Nope. No. Uh, no, no. Uh, signed up for school, uh, to, for Durham college, uh, lasted about three weeks. And then somewhere in that three weeks, I met Antonio and yeah, same thing. Then I quit. <laughs> and then he, I got him start training. He came and started doing some judo and training and, and like, that we just started our career kind of together. What were those sort of, um, those first days, those first judo days, like, um, did you compete right away? Did you? Yeah, I did a, I did a tournament my first week of judo. I did three judo classes and uh, the guy was like, Sensei Dan uh, Griffin, he's like, do you want to do a tournament? And I was like, fuck yeah, I do. <laughs> and uh, actually in that tournament was here in Whitby too. And um, I, uh, yeah, I, I did remember I did four, three or four matches that day. And uh, it just kind of, yeah. And then it was like every weekend after that. And then I have some like pretty gnarly like neck injuries now. And they actually happened like in that very first week of me training ever. People don't like tournaments and stuff now are so beautiful man they're so well run yeah. they're so then it was kind of like all right find a few guys around the same size yeah and let them just fight right like it, it, it must be crazy some of the old injuries and some of the old bumps and oh yeah i'm mangled like i've broken I, i've broken everything i just never fixed it right and then with my neck i have uh like i've got a steel plate and screws and shit like that in my neck and then i've got multiple surgeries coming up because i've had like uh i've got two or three more herniations and then what they call at three what they call stenosis which is like narrowing of the nerve canals and all this shit and then uh i have a new doctor and he was breaking down my mri for me and this is like almost a year ago now and that poor guy man he's i know i'm all fucked up but he's like reading me the results and i'm like i had to tell him i'm like Dude, it's okay man you know what i mean and he's like and at some point here you've you've fractured your your t7 like you actually broke your neck at some point. I'm, no, like, don't, yeah. I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. I know I can tell you exactly when it happened. Like I got thrown by my buddy Chad and I was like, never the same. He hammered me so hard into the floor that I was like, I couldn't catch my breath for like six months. And I'm like, that's when it happened. And even that, that was still, that was less than a year in. So I did kind of, I did my whole career with like a bunch of nasty injuries. I just didn't know any different. I just thought it was normal to be all fucked up. Right. So honestly, it, it kind of was like a yeah. lot of guys, you know, it, it's, we're so much more advanced now. Yeah. It was the, it was the wild west back then. Man. Well, we didn't have access to all the physio and rehab and like all the education that we have now and, and, and the resources to, to go apply that things, those things to yourself. We didn't know about recovery and heart sparring and drilling and just, we literally, we, and it was still style versus style. So you were just making a lot of stuff up without any proper coaching or or know how you're just, we just, we really just winged it. Right. So, and that was the same thing with injuries. You're like, eh, train harder, I guess, you know, <laughs> lift more, who knows? It, it It is just wild thinking back. You were saying, um, everything was style versus style. Pretty much in the beginning. You were a judo guy. Yeah. Um, how, how long were you, you were, you, so when you were with Kichi Sai, which was, you were, you were training specifically judo at the time. Yeah. Yeah. My first like year was nothing but judo. And then I, kind of crossed over in, into the jiu-jitsu a bit because I wanted to do some MMA and that was just made the most sense. And then I really only did ju judo for like less than three years or something like that. And then it was just, I just transitioned into more jiu-jitsu and then, and then really in, in right to MMA. So I, I did, I haven't competed in jiu-jitsu since I was a purple belt or something like that. I never even competed as a black belt. It's crazy. I think I, when I met you, you were a purple belt. Yeah, probably. Yeah. About that. When we I, first started. Yeah. yeah. Which is just a wild thing to think of. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you were saying you only did maybe three years of judo. Yeah. Got your black belt. You are the or one of the fastest ever. I think so. I think, um, I don't know if anyone ever tracked it or anything, but I was a brown belt in less than a year. And then you have to wait around for a year. Like in, you have to be a brown belt for a year and then collect tournament points and all these things in order to 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 mm -hmm. apply for your black belt. And then it's like a big grading. I think I might be the fastest. Actually, there's another guy. His name's Mike Woodcock. He's one of monkey students. Okay. And he is, he probably did it close to the same as me. So he might be a little bit ahead of me or might be 
be a little bit behind me. Like we're both less than three years to black belt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wild. Yeah. I don't know. Even to this, like judo, I could just, I got to work really hard at GTSC. I got to work really hard at kickboxing, but if you want to put a gi on a stand up for some reason, man, I just, I just know how to do it. I can just throw guys like, I don't know, just, I can't even stop throwing guys. And I still make noises and shit when I do it. I'm like, Argh! like I just, it just comes out of me. I can't stop myself. There is something just Fuck, I don't sickeningly know. fun about getting a nice throw. Oh, it's amazing, man. You're stealing, you're like stealing someone's gravity. It's right. Great. Yeah. <laughs> that's the, I, that's the best way I've ever heard it put. Yeah. Yeah. And it like, even the old days of, um, jujitsu tournaments, Nobody was really wrestling. Nobody was really doing judo. You no. suggest that was how drop I drop guys on their heads. Yeah, that was how I got like my first uh, few jujitsu tournaments. I got murdered because these guys are just dragging me to the floor and then finishing me. I didn't really understand what's going on. But once I figured out how to make them both work, like judo tournaments, I was tapping guys out now. And the jujitsu guys, I figured out how to throw them right, and then you just kind of make made it work all together, and then. Uh, because I came, the judo is sort of violent, you know what I mean? So I came, brought that style into the jiu-jitsu we were competitive with. So guys, like, I didn't give an opportunity to jump guards and stuff like that anymore. I just smash guys. Like, in judo, like, you put that dude down hard. Like, you throw him at the floor, right? Mm-hmm. And that's the approach I took. And then, yeah, I just started racking up wins. Um, so you, you, uh, when you, when you first had... When you when did you decide to transition to MMA? Like, at what point were you doing judo? You say you're winning tournaments. You're did, did, was I mean, you saw the UFC. You knew that was where you wanted to get. Yeah. At what point did you want to transition to MMA? I, I from the get go, I wanted to. I just didn't know how, right? But I think my, my first pro fight was in 2000. So I only had three years of training, and it wasn't even proper training. Like, even my first pro fight, like there wasn't. We didn't hit pads. We just. I was. I was gonna say three years. That's pretty much just your judo training. Yeah. Right. Judo and then a bit of jujitsu and then, like, and they hit the bag and go fucking and get a concussion. I mean, you didn't exactly step in with a can first round for your first fight. No. No. Yeah. Well, it's I got like, but back then, so I had David Loazzo my first matchup, but no one knew what each other knew. Yeah. Right back then, it was still still style versus style. So for all this guy knows, I could be throwing fucking smoke bombs, right? And and he's got ninja stars. We don't know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or it's a death touch, whatever. It's such an o- unknown thing. Like with and with no like real. Now you just Google your opponent and you get all your footage you online. You go to YouTube, and, yeah, yeah, and you you find it. Back then there was no. I didn't know who he was. He didn't know know who I was. You know what I mean? Like we didn't figure out. It was like later on in his career that he, that guy turned into a, a star kind of thing. Yes. Else, back then, we were just doing it. Like you fight a guy from Montreal, like all right, that was it. Yeah, just it's just a yeah, exactly, a guy from Montreal. Who for anybody who's not sure, we're talking David the Crow Loazzo. Yep, he uh, he went on fought Rich Franklin for the mm-hmm. UFC title. Like just a an absolute killer. Yeah, he's an animal. That was your that was your first professional fight. Yeah, and your second. Yeah, my second. <laughs> like, yeah, that was a weird one too because it was a tournament format. Which, which is okay. Even that is just wild. Like for people, like the idea of fighting tournaments now, like you're never going to see that on. I know that to me, I mean, I think that's amazing. It's like, amazing. right? That's like how you find out who the man is. Right. It's like, they still do it with, um, glory has like one night tournament, the kickboxing style. So like that. So they still do it, but not as much. And I get why they don't do it because there's too much unknown. So if you're going to do a pay-per-view and it's, these things cost, cost a lot of money and right. there's too many variables that could go wrong. Two guys get hurt in the semis. And then you're, yeah. Then what? Right. Yeah. So what was it all for? Right. They'll do Bellator does tournament format, but they'll do it over two or three mm-hmm. shows or something like that. But I like, I like that one night fight of like, yeah, man. And it just do it all in one night. I think it's fucking amazing. It is just like, Everything, everything's changed. Something like it, it's. I was saying this to somebody the other day. How MMA was illegal in Ontario. Yeah, for so, so long. When like the entire, it's only been uh, sanctioned here for like ten years. It's, which like is that. crazy, right? Yeah. Like, and and we had guys at the gym who were UFC caliber. Yeah, but there was just nowhere to fight. There's like nowhere to go. Driving to Chicago and fighting on native reserves and like yeah. wherever. Yeah, it was wild. You go to shows and like you brought your you brought your own gloves you know there was no commission there was it was just wild like going to ohio and fighting in a square cage you know what i mean there's just it was literally fucking nuts there was no safety in, like for anyone you just but we were all meatheads and we we're just doing it right so it's crazy like like you fought a guy who went on to he was a fight away from being ufc champion mm-hmm. for your first two fights you didn't get 
thousands of dollars for that fight. Oh, dude, I got I fought David for two hundred and fifty bucks. Right, <laughs> like <laughs> you know what I mean. Like, so, so let me ask you why. Like, like what was it that? Because what made you get into the ring with a a, a killer for two two hundred and fifty bucks? Uh, I don't know. Like a lot of reasons steered me in the direction of fighting. A lot of it's just you know your childhood and the things that form you as a person. That's that's why you're there, right? One way or another, I'm probably looking for my dad's love. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I I don't know. I can, all I can say I in I don't know, man. You're just trying to you're a young adult and a young a young man, and you're find, trying to find your place in the world. And my place in the world, like the one thing I know how to do better than anything is was to fight and uh and then they dangle to me and it's the 250 bucks it sounds like shit i probably got that in my wallet right now you know what i mean back then a lot of money man i wasn't working i was starving i was living on couches that's a month worth of groceries for me if you want to look at it like that and it, even then i'm like the potential to be now everyone's a youtube star and in social media and instagram all these things it's like there's nothing to be on the screen now anymore right back then man i'm like you're gonna if you can put me on TV. Mm-hmm. Fuck yeah, I'll do that. You know what I mean? It was like a big thing back then. And like, it just, I think uh, throughout my life, I've always run like headfirst at the shit that scares me the most. Right. To, so for me, I'm like, yeah, man, that's fuck roller coasters. Let's do this. Oh, you yeah. know what I mean? And that was just kind of, and, and for me, I've always been good at it. Like I've, I've, I was always undersized and under, and outmatched or whatever else, but for some reason, man, I could always just fucking fight and it always worked out. So I don't know. That's uh, you hear it's cliche. You hear it all the time, man. Like fish swim, birds fly. Uncle Justin fights. Hell yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's what I do. Um, that's awesome, man. Um, so you were, you spent three years doing judo. You transitioned into MMA. Yep. When did you, um, when did like, when did you start putting together striking jujitsu? Um, we, we started with, um, so my jiu-jitsu was with uh, Professor Shaw Franco and Silvio Baring and then and Richard Yanku and all those guys. We all started kind of, so Shaw got his blue purple belt and I got my blue and we followed up through the system working like that. But Shaw was like a world-class like karate guy too, like badass old school karate, not the shit you learn at the fucking YCMA. Like, like Shaw will fucking kill you. And uh, so I always learned and it just worked. I was never a kickboxer, but that style of striking worked mm-hmm. really well with, the way that I fought like with judo. So I'm like one shot, one kill and it doesn't work. You're in on the clinch anyway. And then you throw guys around and then you jujitsu takes over from there. So the three things, the karate, the judo and the jujitsu all kind of just seemed to blend really well uh, for me together. It wasn't until like later on in my career when I went down a weight and was like near the end of my career when I was like, Oh, I think I can actually like kickbox now, like throw, put together, not one shot, you know what I mean? Put together combinations and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So. No, I remember Shaw, Shaw specifically had that, that very bouncy oh. karate style. It was so. I remember. I remember seeing you guys do it and just thinking, like, this is so cool. It, it was almost like um, like a Machida style. Yeah. Oh, very. It's exactly the same style of karate, and it was just it's the way that that guy to this day Shaw's fifty, and the way that guy or older than fifty actually, but just the way that he taught us to cover ground like quickly in time, guys. Like, just it just really worked out perfect to me. I still use it if I, you know, the way that I train and spar today is like I even with the foot sweeps, I could I couldn't hit a foot sweep in judo to save my life until Shaw taught me how to do a karate style, and I just take everyone off their feet, right? And but karate is seriously underrated martial art. The, the the martial arts like the martial arts are badass. You know what I mean? Like if, like at, in the purest form, you take karate, you take taekwondo. Yep. I know it's been watered down exactly to make like money and stuff. Of like, I get it. Like. You know, people got to make money and have their clubs or whatever. But those first guys doing like, I mean, you saw UFCs where small karate guys were getting in the ring with just huge wrestlers and yeah. kicking their teeth out. Like, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. And it's uh, that's exactly it, right? The guys that were studying that stuff, like the karate. I think it was karate in the sixties and seventies and taekwondo in the eighties. That first, that first round of like legit guys were bad dudes, man. And then, yeah, then we put it up for sale. You know what I mean? And, you, and now you've got big karate schools. Jiu-Jitsu is the same. It is kind of going the same direction. The difference between Jiu-Jitsu is like you kind of can't lie about it. You know what I mean? The mats prove if you're any good at it Absolutely. or not. But you don't even have to be good at it. You just got to be resilient and tough it out. And you get through your belts, right? Do you kind of feel um, MMA has become that way? Like it's a little – I mean because when you think back to where – I mean, if you think about the early UCC days, you got, you know, you were driving out there for no money. And- yeah. I think, uh, I got to love hate with the way that, that it's, 
it's turned into, it's not a martial art anymore. It's a sport, right? And uh, which I like, I like that part of it because I like seeing the great athletes and shine and like good technique and understanding of it. But, and I like the fight, but there's a lot of it where I'm just like, you should have, you should be a martial artist before anything. You should always treat it like you're a martial artist. And then when you're done your career, you still have that, right? When you treat it just like a sport and you're just like an athlete, man, eventually it's going to break your heart and then you don't have anything left. Right. And also as well, if you treat it like a martial art, it just shows the respect and it shows how hard people got to work to really get there. Like people have no idea. They see a guy in the UFC. They didn't know. They don't know. It took him 12 years oh. to get there. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, and they just see that he's eight and one or something like that. I'm like, dude, you know how much information he had to learn just to go and fight once. You know what I mean? Let alone make it to that level. So I think, you know, it's not the sport that I've grown to dislike. It's probably just the fans. It's <laughs> man. I like- Except for that just bleed guy. He's fucking still great. So. <laughs> just <laughs> we're gonna have to we're gonna have to put that graphic yeah, that, on. Yeah, that's yeah. that's hilarious. Mm-hmm. Just please. Mm-hmm. Oh man. Um, let me ask you then, like on the complete opposite end of that, how do you feel about like the Jake Paul, Nate Robinson, that sort of stuff? Like, oh. it's smart. They're getting their money and everything. And- yeah. I, I, again, like I I won't necessarily watch that shit because the reason I watched. Sometimes you get caught up in the hype train and this and that, but the whole reason I watch personally is because of the skill level, right? The problem with the fans and like, and the U, let's say the UFC, uh, I'll get back to that. But the idea is like, so most people don't know what they're watching, mm-hmm. right? So they don't understand the, di- they can't tell the difference between a sea level fighter and a world-class guy. They just, they just see the same thing. See two guys fighting. Right. They don't understand the intricacies and all the things that we understand you yourself included, right? Like, yeah, we're casual fans, but we have training. We understand. Right. So what's a shame is now you get these guys like that are the YouTube boxers and stuff like that. I'm like, man, these guys are getting paid millions and millions of dollars and they fucking suck. Mm -hmm. Right. Like not that they don't suck. Those guys can box. They're good for a guy with two years of training. Exactly. Right. But, you can't hate on them. They created the opportunity for themselves and they're getting paid. It's just a shame that there's guys with a thousand times the skill level that will never get the attention or the money that these guys are creating. But how do you hate on it, man? They're figured it, they built an interest industry for themselves and it really does like actually shine light back on boxing. Right. Absolutely. So I can see why the, the bo- people like the boxing purists and stuff like that would like, are like what the fuck dude. But I'm like, and I'm like yeah, but now because of this chucklehead, people know who you are. You know what I right. mean? So, and it brings more people to the sport and like, it's, Oh, you know, but so yeah, you got that love hate with it. Yeah. 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 You hope it brings more eyes, more money to yeah. the sport overall, but there's that's McGregor right there. Right. Like you love or hate him. Hey, <laughs> but, but like everyone's the pay scale went up because of him. I mean, and and he, at the end of the day is an amazing fighter. Well, he's fucking ridiculous. He good. took the, uh, he, he, he was just so smart. He took the, the WWE plan basically like, yeah, he just started I when when uh when him and um Mayweather actually went on tour yeah. doing shit talking in the ring. It's like okay, like this is not like they're just two smart guys who are getting their money. One hundred. There was no chance they were ever gonna just break out and start yeah. brawling in there. Yeah. Like no, they're it's 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 sports entertainment. Yes. Right. And the beauty of that was and they both they both knew it. You know what I mean? Yep. This the only thing that still bothers me about that that fight is everyone's like, McGregor's an amazing boxer. I'm like, dude. He got he got carried. He for could, sure. Yeah, he like he he landed one punch that what he but that Mayweather if Mayweather if he Mayweather wa- wanted to fucking crush him in the first round, I, like I, he would have crushed him in the first round. Like absolutely. That's the greatest boxer ever. Defensively is especially. You can't if he doesn't want you to fucking no. touch him. You can't touch him. He's a ninja. No, there was right? no way he was going home yeah. with a puffy yeah. eye or anything. Like, yeah, man. He's just, I don't know if he had like a, like a stock in beer sales or something like that, but he was just letting it go so that he could like, that was it, right? You got to, he knows how to sell it. And if you're going out, getting the, getting guys out of there in the first round like that, and the guy he knows he can crush, who's going to buy a ticket to the next one? Definitely. And right? it's the same, it's, and it, there's just, there's no chance Mayweather's taking that fight for, if it's MMA. Yeah, like, well, absolutely. It, it, it's too, it's, it's like a, you know what I mean? It's like LeBron playing hockey or something. Yeah. Like he's a great athlete. I'm sure he could pick it up yeah. quick. And if he spent months, he'd be good at it, but yeah. he's not going to be, you know, no, I look at the McGregor had everything to gain, man. Yeah. Nothing, nothing to lose. And he went, he get a hundred million dollars. Exactly. Right. And then, yeah. Like you can't blame him. Yeah. So yeah, again, sports entertainment and they, they shine light. They, that shine more light on both sports. Right. 
So let me. Okay, so this is this is interesting. Kind of speaking about this, you're uh, you're a big personality. You know, do you think if social media was more what it was back when you guys were coming up, if there were more kind of opportunities for exposure in that? Do you think it would have made? Do you think you could have been in the McGregor spot kind of thing? Uh, I don't think so. Like, I'm. It's all hypothetical. Yeah. What? Well, like. I'm a personality and I'm animated, but I'm not like that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I don't talk a lot. I talk shit, but not like actual shit. You know I mean, I, I trip my buddies and whatever else. I'm, and I am animated. I like to put on a show and perform it, but not really. I think the social media thing uh, came right at the right time to, in order to grow with the sport almost, you know what I mean? Cause Instagram's really hasn't been big that long, like in the grand scheme of things, definitely like, mm -hmm. like in the, it's the last 10 years or whatever. Right. Same what's so the growth, they, I think they're both things like that and music and everything else. They all kind of just grew together, right? Because the music, mu something like the, the music industry has changed as well. Mm -hmm. And social media has made that industry change. Like social media has changed everything. And I think it goes, it kind of goes both ways with that. You know what I mean? I think it, it probably just all fell into place at the same time. I don't think, um, I don't imagine my career path would have changed too much had you give me that stuff, but who knows? You don't think like um, wearing a Leafs jersey? In Montreal, you know, that clip goes viral or something. Uh, you know, like, like, I mean, you had moments like, like, like they yeah. were just, and, and like, that's without doing, you guys were just doing it to, to cause shit. Yeah. Like, you well, weren't you doing it what? to blow up. Like, it wasn't designed to be a. I did, I did figure out early on that you had to sell tickets, right? So we were going to be the away team every single time. So it's just easier to get people to dislike you. And now I'm not a kind of guy that talks a lot of shit and gets and wants to, con wants controversy or stir mm. people up. It's just not my nature. But you got to give, you got to give people a reason to pick a side, and it could be because when they pick a side, that means they bought a ticket, right? So when I'm the guy in Montreal showing up in Leafs jersey, you're like, "Fuck that guy!" Absolutely. But everyone at home was like, "Fuck that guy!" You know what I mean? Like, so you gotta. That's what fighting is, man. It's an opportunity. People like I always, I try not to get hot, caught up in the hype, but I want to. I'm gonna pick a side. That's otherwise, why are you watching? Mm -hmm. Of course, I enjoy the beauty of the sport and the martial art, but I'm like, I'd be fucking lying if I didn't want Poirier to win. You know what I mean, or whatever. Like course, that's right. that's that's what it is. It's, it's it's like the easiest thing in the world to understand from a sporting point of view. You're like one guy wins, one guy loses. That's it. And so they sell it. So you're on a side, and you bought a ticket to the show. There's like a there's a saying for pro wrestling, and they say you've either got to be like you're either going to pay your money to like see the good guy, or yeah. you're going to pay the money to see the bad guy get his ass kicked. Yeah, man, that's all. And it it's is. and like because they like um, McGregor's an amazing fighter. There's other guys who were on his level at the time and they just didn't have that personality to yeah. get, you know what I mean? That, yeah. so it, it is, it's, it, it, it is crazy kind of to see how social media and that, like, yeah. But yeah, again, like, yeah, whether you, whether you love McGregor or hate McGregor, you bought a ticket to watch McGregor. He exactly. doesn't, he doesn't go fuck what side you're on just, as long as his check cash. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah, that's, he's such a smart guy in the business. Oh, absolutely, man. I think he just sold his, uh, his whiskey company, shit like that. Do you ever yeah. try that? It's fucking <laughs> garbage. <laughs> I just, pay, I just, pay, pay me anyway, but it's, it's man, he makes good decisions. He's surrounding himself with, with smart people. He knows how to talk and he's, yep. he got paid. Good Absolutely. For, good for him. Yeah. You can't hate, can't hate a guy for just, no, for using the system, right? Like he didn't do anything. No. And even better, even more like he, he helped build the system. There's a blueprint now. No one can duplicate what he does. Mm -hmm. Right. But people are going to try it sucks because people come off and it sounds corny. Right. But like, he laid it out there, right? And he brought a lot of people to the game. I mean, even when you think about kind of the dark days of UFC when, I mean, when we were training, when people yeah. weren't really watching, Tito Ortiz. Yeah, he's the same thing. He was a guy who people wanted to, He, you know, he did the grave digger. People wanted to tune in to see, ah, I want to see this guy get his ass kicked. Yeah. And he really kind of held it on, like, during the dark days there. Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, he kind of knew you had to build that that character, that WWE, whatever. You know what yeah. I mean? And, like, I've met him. He's not really like that he's a nice enough dude but you know and the thing is and looking back at that you're like man pretty cheesy because he wasn't actually very good at it but he was the only one really trying to he do was it a right? he was the first yeah. kind of character in yeah. mma yeah that's funny I, I remember meeting him at a freedom fight yeah that's with, right yeah, yeah, and yeah. big old coke, having gary goodridge and biggest and fucking coconut you've ever seen on my head. his head is so big <laughs> the one thing I'll, I'll never forget in my life was barry McDonald yeah. was riding his scooter around him in the lobby of the hotel. <laughs> Just kept at, Hey man, you're uh you're pretty big. <laughs> Do you work out? <laughs> Just actually, just, just, just no selling that he knew who he was. And... Fuck. Oh man. What, 
what crazy times like mm. even even thinking about that that was kind of a that was a show here and they had like gary goodridge dan henderson was there yeah like tito ortiz i met the mma community was just so wild then like it yeah. was i think what's really made mma like appealing to people is that the athletes are so accessible all the time you're never we just go walk up and meet Tito Ortiz yeah. or anyone. You know what I mean? It's changing a little bit now, but like you don't get to go walk up and talk to an NBA player for sure, or, yeah. or, or like it, or any other professional athlete. You don't just walk up. They, mm-hmm. These guys, they're out in the crowd and they're circling. Like they under. That's kind of part of the deal. Like uh, Vanderlei Silva will do an autograph signing, and that guy will not fucking leave until everyone, every single person. There'd be thousands of people. He's like, and his manager be like, "Dude, we got to go." He's like, "Fuck you, man! These people came to see me." He'll right. wait. He'll wait till every last person gets what they said hi and got their autograph and signed their shirt or and shook their hands and did their picture. He won't leave until they're finished, right? And that's like the sports full of people like that, and I think that's why people can can relate and it's easy to understand. Like, pick a side completely. Right? It's, I remember, I remember hearing a thing about, I don't remember who said it, like, this is a bad quote, so, but they were just talking about comparing, say, like, basketball to MMA, and say, in basketball, if you dunk on the guy, you might think, like, ah, like, that sucks, but in the back of his head, he'd be like, I can kick your ass, though. Yeah. And MMA is just the purest boiled down, like, there's no... It's all, it doesn't lie, man. Yeah. Right? The only thing more pure would be a fight to the death, right? But the, that's that, like... It's very simple to understand, and the truth uh, uh, unveils itself very quickly when you lock that door, right? And you find out, and you just go. Some of these, uh, some of those old shows weren't far off from that. Oh man, I saw some really bad shit happen. Like the show you mentioned earlier, we were there, and the guy dude went in, he got knocked out. Bad. Oh, I know, I remember yeah, that. Right? Remember the guy who took the axe kick? Uh, no, not that guy. I remember that, that, that was a rough night. Yeah, it was a weird one. That was that was, where, that was where Monkey climbed up the ropes. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah on on uh, Jeremy Bolt, but that, yeah. that that night in particular, there was a guy who got knocked out. Went back and he went back to the change room, showered up, changed, and then put all his gear back on and got his mouth guard. And everyone was kind of like, "What are you doing, dude?" Didn't know that he fought. Oh no! Yeah, he completely lost the entire night. <sighs> Jesus. Right, and that shit happens all the time. I cornered a guy out west, and um, he was definitely it was a bit of a setup, and he got into a middleweight fight when he was probably walking that well through weight and he got he was doing all right but he started getting lit up in the end and he got cornered and he was taking some heavy heavy shots and i'm like throw back throw back but he was already sleeping you know what i mean and then he fucking yeah after he was done after that because he went blind in one eye right so he got that shit punched out of him and like you're gonna it's it's fucking dangerous as shit. No matter what anyone says, anytime you go out there, you're risking your life. Life, man. yeah, yeah. It, it it truly is. Like, I was, I have a lot of bumps and bruises and whatever else, but like, don't. It will fucking. It's gonna change you, man. If you do it for any amount of time, it's gonna change you. Like whether it's in your head or your heart or your body, it's it'll it's gonna change you forever. Mm. Like it's real. That guy's. I don't want to hurt anyone, but I'll fucking kill you before you hurt me. Right. So that's just the way it is. And it is, it is real, man. Like you're going to see now the way the guys are fighting, they're just biting down and going again. And you're going to see a generation of guys that are all fucked up, right? Because that's the approach they took to it. I just wanted to ask. So I just want to go back a little bit. Yeah. We, uh, we talked about your first two fights. Here it comes. <laughs> Were you, you, you're uh, you're a UCC champ at the time. Yeah. So how so you won the belt from from Dave? Mm-mm. It was in the tournament. No, I went. Um, how did I win that? I had I lost to David in the second one, and then I fought. Uh, they changed the weight classes a bit, so I went down in weight, and I ended up against. Uh, I had a couple fights at at a lower weight. Tedarius Thomas, and then uh, and then I I beat a, for the belt. I beat a guy named Phil Hughes. And, uh, that, so that would have been, they called it lightweight then, but it was, uh, it's welterweight now. Cause they back then there was only, I was going to say they only had a couple of weight classes. They, had three, right? they only had three weight classes at first, right? It was, uh, yeah. 170 to like one to 200. 
Yeah. You know what I mean, that's kind of how it was. So, uh, I, I beat a guy named, uh, Phil Hughes for the title. I defended it once. And then after that, I ran into a fellow named, uh, his name is George. <laughs> nine, a little known, a little known martial yeah, artist. Yeah. I'll have a look. There's nine, nine million views on YouTube. I haven't using my head as a fucking basketball. That's gotta be, that's, that's gotta be insane though. You came across arguably the greatest mixed martial artist of yeah. all time. Um, like when I, I watched, I've only watched that fight a couple times cause it was just me literally just getting my shit pushed in. And, uh, but like, and at the time I lost my belt and my, my world was over. Cause that was like, that's all I ever had ever. The only thing I ever really accomplished. And it was like a big deal, especially like, and for our team and for my, where I lived and like, that was it. Right. I was our guy. And then that was taken from me. And I went into like a spiral because like that, to me, that was my identity. And then like, you got over it in time and it, and it was like in the big picture, that was the best fight to ever happen to me because I became more disciplined and went down to 155 and then, and which oh, then I ended up in Japan and which opened up into like doors for everyone to compete. Right. So like I, I knew, I remember talking to my buddy Bruiser afterwards. Cause like, I remember George hit me with a takedown and that. And I actually, he sat me on my ass and I actually remember like saying out loud in the ring, I'm like, shit. Like, I didn't even think he was going to wrestle me. I thought we were kickboxing, right? You and were then, the judo guy. Yeah, and he just fucking throttled me. And I remember him grabbing on me, and I was like, holy shit, this kid's strong. And then he just smashed me at, like, one moment of brilliance where I escaped the mount, got to my feet, and then he just picked me up and threw me on the floor again anyway. And it was that was the beginning of the end. He was on top of me. Like, he was even side. He was just smashing me. You know, I, I didn't even know where I was anymore. And by the end, I, I knew I couldn't get out of the mount. The first mount escape... I just kind of gave up my back and forced to scramble because I couldn't get out. So I was like, ah, if he chokes me, he chokes me. So everything, I'll just scramble, run for it. And I got out. And then he took me down and did it again. Same pass, same everything. Still to the same pass he does to this day. And then he got them out. And I was like, I was just seeing like triple because I was concussed. And I kind of was like in a position where I'm just kind of like, uh, take my arm, I guess. You know what I mean? And, and I'm like, then I'll have another opportunity for a scramble, scramble. Right. Mm -hmm. But I was like three steps behind that point. He just turned it on and that was it. Right. And, uh, but again, like that was, that was the best thing to ever happen to me. Right. I'm, and I'm, I'm grateful that, man, I can legitimately say I, bet I fought the best the fighter greatest. Of, all, of all time. Didn't know it at the time. Right. Like I was the champ. I was the favorite, whatever else, but I'm glad it played out the way it did. You know, I'm part of that guy's legacy. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, uh, and it put me on a path that made me a better person and open, yeah, open tons of doors and opportunity for, for myself and my teammates, like had I not lost to George, I wouldn't end up in Shudo. If I didn't end up in Shudo, I wouldn't have gone to Japan. If I didn't go to Japan, Antonio wouldn't have gone to the UFC. You know what I mean? Like it was all supposed to kind of go like that. Like I, George being pissed at me enabled me to see the world. That's kind of, so I never look back at that fight with anything, but like, like good thoughts, man, like pride, like that's, it was supposed to go down like that. And I, I've said this a million times, man. It was because everyone's like, Oh, you'll get him next time. Like, no, nah, man, that guy, I fight that guy a hundred times. He's going to beat me up 100 times. It's just, it's a hard thing for people to accept that there's just people better at shit than you. And that guy's better at fighting than I am. I mean, he's better at fighting than everyone, every the whole, person the whole, in the world, in the world. Right. Like, I know, but people have a hard time swallowing their pride and make excuses and this and that. And I'm sure I did too, but like, yeah, I'm like, I lost, I could have perfect training, right? Everything can go perfect, weight cut, perfect diet, perfect, everything perfect. I'm going to lose. Cause he's just better. Right. And people have a hard time saying that it, it about anything. Oh, you lost this game of Scrabble because this is like, no, that motherfucker smutter in you. That's it. Right. Like sometimes people are just better. Right. I mean, who knows? <laughs> 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 who knows? The perfect weight cut. Maybe. Yeah. No, like, no, no, I'm just Jordan. Like it, 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 there's a, there's a very, very strong argument for pound for pound. He is the greatest <laughs> martial artist. Yeah. of all time yeah and everyone uh and there is guys that are like up you know the Usman's and all these guys like demetrius johnson like these guys but uh george is the guy that laid the blueprint on how to be like a a proper mixed martial artist like you you knew what george was gonna do but you he was gonna take you down and punch you out and if you right and then or he like you knew he was gonna try to take you down hmm. right you just never knew which was coming. If you were defending the takedown, he'd punch you in the head. And if you're defending the punches, he'd take you down. You knew what he was going to do. He's just so good at everything. 
and so strong and just intelligent, intelligent in his approach and his training. He laid that blueprint out for everyone else to, like now to get involved in the sport and be great. Right now the sport attracts stud athletes. Guys are going to like picking wrestling and going to like schools based on wrestling so that they can do MMA when they're done their collegiate career. Yes. Right. Right. So as opposed to just being a wrestling guy who's, you know, knows how to throw a couple punches. Yeah. And, right. Like people are basing their lives around. Right. The one thing I'll always remember about George is right after he lost the first time to Matt Hughes. Yeah. Remember he came and did, um, he did that jujitsu tournament. Yeah. I like, was supposed to be, I was in that right. and I, I had to pull out. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And like, and he had nothing to get. He was a, he was a major star at the time. He just yeah. fought for the belt and he came and did a, a tournament with, I, I think Rodrigo was in it. There were, there was just some stud jujitsu guys and he was competing against them. Yeah. And like, he really, and I just, he had nothing to gain and just, he just wanted, he got caught in the arm bar and just yeah, wanted, he just to, wanted imp- to want to improve his jiu Yeah, he just like, wanted to get better. Yeah. Insane. Like, yeah. Yeah. That's when you, um, when you fought him, he had a couple fights. Like, did you kind of know, did you know this guy was on, he obviously you knew he was a good fighter and everything. He, uh, I know he'd fought in Menjivar. He had a great fight with Menjivar, who was another stud. And another then the Canadian. Yeah. Legend. But the, who went? He went to UFC as well. But he, I think he had, um, because Montreal was a different planet when it came to the MMA. Like they were having all sorts of like different smokers and in houses and MMA type stuff that we didn't have here. So they were, <clears throat> excuse me, they were a little bit ahead of us. So who knows how many matchups he actually had before? He could have had one. Mm-hmm. He could have had five. I don't know because it wasn't documented. Like as far as professional, like none. But I don't know experience wise what else he was up to, right? But. Like, so who knows? But I had 200 judo and jiu-jitsu matches. It didn't help me. So, <laughs> you know? So. When did you start transitioning into into teaching, into coaching? Um, so we, uh, the way it worked out, because you were one of my first students, is that we were at the judo club here. And then uh, I was given some mat space to do my own thing, the jiu-jitsu and stuff like that. And then we got an opportunity to, to go to Ajax, right? Yep. And uh, with a boxing club that gave us some mat space. And you guys, you and your brothers were my first yeah. first students. And uh, we were there for only, we were there for less than a half a year. And then another, another opportunity came up uh, in Oshawa in, in the basement of, that's conveniently right. enough, in the basement of a beer that's store. That's my favorite gym of yeah, all time. And, and, the, and uh, what was it, the Milky Way or where yep. it was? Reed's Dairy. Reed's Dairy, Dairy right yeah. So they, beer and milkshakes and fuck, <laughs> like in violence. It was amazing. And beer, like, it, beer, milkshakes, and violence might yeah, be the title of this episode. Yeah, yeah, it's a fucking perfect hat trick. And then, uh, th- and we built it from there. And uh, they said the guy that opened that place, Murray, uh, he was a traditional martial arts and he got it going and mm-hmm. and eventually he just handed it to me he's like i'm this is your thing man do it and uh i ran with it and then we moved on from there so i'd say um it was 2004 when i opened my gym uh it was and then and then i kind of i think that was just after i retired I hadn't retired. It was just after my last fight. I was I was training and fighting while I had the gym open originally, and then with it by 2006, I kind of accepted I was a little too beat up to go on competing, and then I just it was just all gym ever since then, and just I think we moved one two another two times after that, and just it got bigger and bigger, and now now I just fucking wander around like Ronan, do what I want. Just waiting so. for the, the next chapter. Yeah. I, I know uh, you got some, some stuff. We'll, 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 we'll touch on it. Yeah, I, know, I know you got some stuff that, I got some, that's, that's I got coming down the pipe. Going on. Yeah. I love it. I love seeing you. I love seeing you happy, man. It's yeah, great. I'm trying, man. Uh, there's wild shit in my head that makes life difficult sometimes, but I do have a lot of really cool like stuff on the horizon that I'm excited to share with people. So. Awesome. So the gym you established 2004. Yeah. We were, where was the, where was the first spot? Uh, we were in Whitby, right? And then we went to Ajax That's right. and Whit- then, yeah, yeah. And, with, uh, the Tillers boxing in Ajax. And then we went to, uh, Oshawa uh, in the, on King. And then we went down South after that. Just, it's so wild thinking about like, um, like the Kichi side <laughs> days. I remember, so I went to sign up and I met Dan Yeah, and like talked to him for a bit. I was like, oh, I kind of, I kind of want to try karate. Like, I think he goes, no, nah, you'll do judo. <laughs> and I, I was like, okay, that sounds fun. He's like, yeah, the judo guys, you'll like them. I was like, okay, cool. Like my dad's kind of like, all right, do we like 
do we pay? And he goes, oh, no, just come by. Like, here's a gi, and uh, this is the code to the gym. <laughs> I know, <laughs> <Yeah>. man. <laughs> Heart of gold, bad business sense. Like, you know, you know where I got it from. It right? was just the Wild West, man. Like, yeah. We're like, oh, all right. Like, I, I guess he's trust us. Yeah, right. He, and I get, like, Dan was an odd duck, but he believed in me, and mm-hmm. he gave me a huge opportunity. And, like, when I kind of, and I grew out, I grew him really, really fast. And you know, when I had to leave, it was a difficult decision and it really broke my heart because I think I broke his. But at the same time, like he knew I had to go because I'd, I had exploded past everyone in there. And I think he knew that I was on a path to something a lot bigger than just doing judo and whippy, you know what I mean? And it, tur- it turned out with like, a, you know, to be the case. So Absolutely. I'm really lucky I, I met that guy, you know, like none of us would be here without Dan Gribben. Absolutely. So. It's funny, man. I remember just Wednesday night, no gi classes. I yeah. can't say. Yeah, that's how it started. None of us knew what we were doing. And then we just fucking fight. <laughs> uh, yeah, because they used to do judo on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Yeah. And then he told me, he's like, oh, go, uh, he's like, go check out Justin's. Mm-hmm. I remember just the first time I ever went there, Antonio just, he just grabbed a rope and just skipped for 90 minutes. Yeah. And I was he's, like, all right, these guys are, yeah, these guys are scary. Yeah. Antonio's a weird dude. <laughs> So I puts down his Sega Genesis, grabs a rope, <laughs> skips for an hour, goes back to his Nintendo. Yeah. So. Oh, that's great. So the gym was founded 2004. Yeah. And then I want to ask you about April 9th, 2005. That was the Stefan Bonner, Forrest Griffin fight. Oh, yeah. That yeah. changed. That changed everything. everything, man. That changed everything. I think that was on like a Wednesday night or what was it? It was know. It was the middle of the week. I remember because they had the Ken yeah. Shamrock, Rich Franklin. like, And it was... It was that Monday, man. I remember, I think I was in high school because I remember I went to school the next day and just everybody just, yeah. it was, it was all anybody could talk about. Yeah. It was the, it was a week after that where my business kind of just, because we were the only ones around that had, that did any real jujitsu. And I was the only person for, I don't know how far in any direction that had done professional MMA. Right. So I was the only way, way to go. So that's when, that's when my gym kind of took off like that, that, that fight changed like the landscape of martial arts for sure. It was a game changer for me. Like it went from like kind of having a job to like actually having a career. Right. So yeah, it was a, uh, it was pretty cool. What did, yeah, that's such a huge moment. And then after that, it just, you spent years yeah, coaching, coaching and training and traveling and, uh, and then, and then building the kids was the biggest thing. The last, like, five, 10 years, like put, putting all, you put a lot of focus on the kids where at first you just want, I just want to train competitors and this and that. And then you realize, fuck that, man, mm-hmm. you got to eat, right? Fighters are useless, man. We don't got any money. Fucking we're always late. Like no, nah, man, you need the kids. And then I figured out over the years is like, that's actually my true calling is like, you know, not to create great fighters is to help create good fucking humans. Right. And, uh, and help people and, and put them on a positive path. Right. And like, martial arts gives so much bad, so much to people. Right. And like, I, it changed every day. You get a message from someone whose life, you know, you affected one way or another, or maybe I, co- I taught someone who's now coaching a kid whose life he's changing or whatever. Right. So that's it, especially the last five years, I put everything into my kids and like, and just trying to make, you know, more resilient, better people and less worry about the fight. Right the fight comes and goes, the sport comes and goes that the martial art will stay with you forever. So that's the kind of stuff you want to drill into the kids. Right. And that's where, that's when my gym took off is when I focused more on like building better martial artists and not worrying about the sports side so much. That's, that's amazing, man. I can tell you 100% you, uh, you changed my life and my family's like, Oh man. Well, I, I, I could say the same. I wouldn't be here without you guys, man. If I hadn't met you and your dad and like, and you guys been a part of my life, there's no way I would have been as successful as, as I, uh, as I am. Like it's, it's uh, one of the biggest things that is, man, you find your, I got to find my family, you know, cause my family dynamic growing up was very strange. So when I was introduced to you guys and how you guys interact with your dad and stuff like that, I'm like, Oh, it's, it's supposed to be like that. <laughs> you know what I mean, like I learned how to be a dad from a lot of it from your dad, you know? So, uh, for sure. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have, uh, I wouldn't be where I am without you guys either, man. So like it, it works both ways. Right. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm very proud of that. I, I, it's, it's funny. I can remember, um, I can remember the night, like I remember you and my dad went out and you talked about opening up the club and yeah. kind of what a, what a journey. Like yeah. You, yeah, now, now, now you've been, you've been around the world. You've been, 
Yeah, and for, I'm very fortunate, man. Like some of I still like well, this last year is a bit of a shit show, right? But I've still like I find myself in places in the world or whatever. I'm like, how the f- how the fuck did this happen? Like, how did we get here? Because like I've literally eaten out of a fucking dumpster and slept under a flight of stairs. And now I'm like flying around the world first class and doing cool shit. And like, I still catch myself like watching the sunrise or set somewhere. I'm just like, how'd you get here, man? Like, this is amazing. You know what I mean? It was all because I put on a gi one day and just fucking went for it. Like, it sounds like, oh, you found your destiny. This time, like, I literally had nothing else to do. That's all that <laughs> happened. You know what I mean? I was like, I can, I, can, I can fight. This guy let me train for free. And, and I just kept going and going. And uh, what I can tell you for a fact is, when I started training, it made me a man and because it made me a more, it made me, a, it made me uh, much more tolerant and understanding of people, but it made me way more accountable to myself. Right. And when I accept started martial arts made me accept uh, the, the, my problems and issues and doubts and all those things that they're my fucking problem. I got to own them and I got to fix them. And uh, when I started doing that and started being accountable for my own mistakes and things that I've done in the past and what I'm responsible for my future, then all of a sudden, man, I had a team of people behind me that were like, fucking go Justin, rah, rah, rah. And they're still with me to this day, right? Mm -hmm. Because no one likes a fucking sulker and no one wants a guy, likes a guy that makes excuses, this and that. But when you see a guy pick, you know, pull his shit together and continue on the path, like everyone gets on that, everyone gets on board and helps you out and pushes you. I just... <clears throat> nothing I've done was ever by myself it's because I've been surrounded by people that fucking, you know, helped me believe in my, believed in me and helped me believe in myself. And that's all because martial arts taught me to own shit, man. Mm-hmm. Like I said, we're responsible for our own, our own bullshit, man. Right. Mats don't lie. Oh, no, they don't. Right. And if you can take that and translate it into the rest of your life, you're mm-hmm. going to be okay. Rule number one, right? But yeah, man. Don't be a pussy. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Um, I mean, it's been a great, great martial arts talk. Yeah. Let's let, let you've got to, you got to kind of travel the world, man. Where, um, like, where are some of your favorite places you've gone? Like um, Japan, <clears throat> let's talk about Japan the first time, actually. I, the, the, I was so happy to go to Japan. So I got a fight in, uh, Shudo, which is like, at the time was the biggest organization in the world, especially if you're 150. I was, I was going to say, because there was no weight class for that yeah, in UFC at the time. Right. There was no 155. So all the best guys at that weight class and you smaller, they all want to go to Shudo to Japan. So I got the invite to go over there. And, um, for a couple of reasons, I, I was excited to go. I wanted to f- compete and travel. I'm like, I want to go to Japan. But the other reason was like, uh, professor Shaw, uh, my coach, World camp, world, been traveled the entire world and world champion in karate. He never got to go to Japan in his life. He never got, and I remember telling him, like, I'm going to fucking take you to Japan one day. And he's like, all right, man. And then we got that call and I'm like, we're like, we're going to fucking Tokyo. And he's like, hell yeah. And we went and it was, it all happened really fast. I was in there, cut weight and out of there in like four days. Like, and it was like, that's a 15 hour flight. You know, it's crazy. So it wasn't even when it happened, it wasn't even real looking back at it. What, especially recently watching footage that and I'm like, it was, it's nuts, but it was amazing, man. Just wandering around like me and Shaw were like little kids, like just wandering around, like going, I can't even believe this place is real. It was the fucking best, man. I've really loved Japan. I've been back. I went back with Antonio. Uh, when he fought Rumi Sato, and I got went back with Lindsey Garber, and I got to be in a fucking reality television mm. show, and like I, every time I go there, I really like it more and more, <clears throat> and I can't say that about anywhere else because I travel. I've been to thirty something countries in my life, and I try never to go back to the same place twice because it's never as good as it was the first time. You know what I mean? Mm. Except for Japan. Japan gets better every time you go. Well, that's amazing. And, yeah, it's fun there. Awesome. One, one, uh, one trip. I heard you on another podcast, um, talk about, you went to Berlin with Sammy. Yeah. You guys saw Pearl Jam. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, Man. My son's first concert was Pearl Jam in, in Berlin. Berlin. That's yeah. I have, I have this really amazing photo at home of just Sammy and I leaning against the, the Berlin wall. Yeah. That's so yeah, cool. And ain't like that kid's he's been, He's all, you know, he's been very fortunate that he's got to travel the world already. He doesn't even know, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. He's only 12 and the kid's been to like 15 countries or something Amazing. like that, right? So I've never bought that kid a toy in his life or if anything. I'm like, because he's kind of spoiled because he's an only child and whatever else. But I'm like, I'm going to save for five years and take you on a fucking Walt Disney cruise though. You know what I mean? Like, I want him to remember me as like 
Like you don't, he is not going to remember the toys he left on the floor. He's going to know that he was in Germany with his dad and he went and saw fuck. He doesn't know who the fuck Pearl Jam is, but it's still cool as shit. Oh yeah. That's a lot of a story, man. Yeah. Right. Like he's been a lot of really rad places. He's been to Croatia and Germany and, and, uh, like Ireland. And I think he's been in Italy and France. He's been a lot of amazing places. Right. So pretty fortunate little shit. I'm going to have to go home and remind him. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> you're a you're a big concert guy yourself uh i just the last few years i started kind of getting back into the live music i gotta i'm like i'm pretty introverted even though it looks like i'm really social you know what i mean like this, this here is my job i don't wander like i talk because i'm that's what i'm good at now you know what i mean and i don't go out much i don't do shit so if i go to a show it's a destination or it's like, man, I got to fucking love, love, love you. Right. So, uh, yeah, I, I got back into the music a little, like recently. I don't know. I'll always go see my favorites. Like Rancid comes every summer. You go see Rancid, whatever else. But like now I'm like, I want to see Rancid. I went and saw Rancid in Southern California. Oh, I went and saw Dropkicks in, in Boston, in, right? in Boston on, on St. Patty's. Amazing. You know what I mean? Like, and stuff like that. I'm like, I, I saw Foo Fighters. I don't even like Foo Fighters, but they were playing July, they were playing July 4th in Washington. I'm like, I'll go to Hell that. Yeah. Saw Nas and Dave Chappelle at Radio City oh, Music yeah. Hall in fucking New York City. Like, so I, I saw, and same thing, Soul Distortion. Like, I try to catch the bands I really love in a city that I really want to see now, right? So I'm like, any fool can go down to Toronto watch a show sure. like i gotta i got, always got a fucking one-up stuff right so there's two i want to ask you about How, yeah first that nas or the nas dave chappelle the coolest shit ever because they did the whole thing with a they did illmatic with a uh or, orchestra oh man and they they he they orchestra came in the day before and he's like play the album he's like okay and that's it they just did it the next day and they ripped through it yeah so cool and chappelle uh, Chappelle was fun. Yeah, it yeah. was pretty cool. I don't do. Are like, you a big stand-up guy? Like, nah, uh, a little bit. Like, that, I just couldn't miss that opportunity. It's, that Chappelle thing, he did like seven days straight, mm-hmm. and he had one night with like the Roots and one with Nas, and I think he had Jay Z one night. Like, he had like all these like huge New York guys. Mm-hmm. So that was, and that we, it just happened that we ended up with Nas for me, which was pretty dope. And then, uh, yeah, this the stand-up was fun. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it just being in Radio City Music Hall is really cool. One show um, I remember you talking about, and I've always been jealous of, is you saw James Brown. Yeah, man. Pretty pretty awesome. Like, that guy, and I don't know how old he was when I saw him, but uh, just an absolute savage. Like, still up there. He was probably in his 70s, just still shaking his ass. And, like, everything was so perfectly produced. And the music, every musician in his bands are, like, the best in the world at what they do. And I actually had, I had, um, tickets to go see him again and he fucking motherfucker died the day before the day before yeah i think he i think he died on christmas and we had tickets for boxing day oh, or something man. like that he died the day before and i was like you son of a bitch but i'm gonna let it slide because i got to see him so <laughs> it was incredible yeah oh uh, yeah man it was amazing experience like yeah yeah even then i didn't really realize how amazing that is and just looking back now i'm like dude you saw james brown it's pretty cool. Hell yeah. Right. And now I have even more of an appreciation for music now than I did back then. Right. So, but yeah, just watching like, like the perfect brass section and the perfect drummer and bass player, like everything. And then all those dancers and everything all just perform. Like, yeah, it's pretty cool. It was a pretty cool show. That's amazing. Any, uh, any other shows or anything that you, that really like stood out to you that you've been to? Yeah. I got to go see, uh, my favorite artist right now is uh I, there's a uh, guy named Brother Ali. He's my oh, favorite yeah. guy to listen to. And I got to go watch him and like um uh my buddy got us um like meet and greet and so you go meet him, hang out, whatever else. And then you got to watch he just came out. It was like me and six other dudes in the room and just came out and grabbed the mic and fucking rhymed for us and then <laughs> just left. And then, then he came back later on and played the show. So we just sat there while he did his sound check and he just comes around and, he, and he's like super, super nice guy. And like, it was, that was a fun show to watch. And a couple other, other, that others like, yeah, that, you know, I got to, I watched the interrupters last year, which was a pretty cool shoot, show to watch. And the same thing we got, they, we ended up at a bar where they were doing the sound check with like 10 other people. And it's just us and them in the room. And so I've had some experiences where I got to meet like a lot of my favorite artists. I got to meet Mike Ness from Soul Dis- Distortion because my, one of my guys was boxing on the same card as his as his son. Oh no you know way! What I mean? So that was pretty neat. Like I've been, uh, yeah, I've been fortunate as far as like music and meeting people and stuff like that. Like 
yeah, like, I don't know. I just, yeah, I'm, I only go to shows that I'm really down with the artists and they have, I have a connection with that music to begin with. Mm-hmm. Right. So when I meet these guys, like I met Mike Ness and I was like, good. I was like, I felt like a fucking idiot. Cause like, I'm not a star. I'm not a fanboy. It's not my nature. I'm like around, you know, I meet a lot of people Definitely. and whatever else. But I met that guy and I was like, I didn't know what to say, man. Cause in him, I, his music in my head is what like plays. You know what I mean? So I met him. I was like, good, uh, your music changed my life. And he's like, me too, dude. I'm like, all right. <laughs> like that was our conversation. You know, you know, like totally dropped the ball. Like, I'm like, fuck, he was right there. You had so many questions you wanted to ask. And Brother Ali was the same. I'm like, and so much stuff I want to know. And then I met him. I was like, duh, I didn't know what to do, you know? It's so funny. It is weird when you meet somebody who you like, you really admire. Yeah. And it's like, what do you, what do you tell them? Like, yeah. anything, anything that you can say, they've, they've heard. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, right. Uh, it's like, hey, I'm not weird, but I, I really dig your stuff. And yeah, I know. <laughs> like, I know. Well, that's their job. And for those two particular, Mike Ness and Brother Ali, I was, I was like, I, yeah, no, I, I just, I was happy I met my heroes because a lot of times you can be so disappointed when you meet people and you're like, oh, like I was kind of a dick or whatever. So you try not to like judge, but those two guys were just super kind and nice and took their time out, whatever. So it was kind of cool. Yeah. It's uh, it's pretty amazing. Like just all the, the people you've met and the places mm-hmm. you've got to go. A lot of it just through martial arts. Like it's all, be, all, excuse me, all one way over, no, over another. Yeah. Like none of it would have happened if I didn't, train you know what i mean like i had this conversation at home the other day where i'm like because there's days where i'm like fuck man i don't even know what i had for breakfast like i'm i'm beat up and i have some you know physically i'm i got a lot of pain issues and i know i have some brain injuries and stuff like you know i've been bounced around my whole life now and i'm like i'm like all this stuff but now i'm just kind of fucked and tara was like you were kind of fucked anyway man. don't worry about it you know what i mean yeah. like if i i mean from day one of judo yeah and but bef- if I didn't get on the mat, I was dead anyway. Yep. Like I wouldn't have made it out of my twenties if I didn't put it on a gi. I was on a fucking path of destruction when it be like the day before I put on a gi, man. You know what I mean? That was my life. Drank, fight, fucking whatever. It's the life of alcohol and women and fighting and everything else. That was life. And I think if had I not stepped on the mats, it would have killed me. Right. It sounds like, like to anybody listening, it maybe just sounds like, you know, you stepped on the mats and everything just got good for you, but it, it wasn't like that. Like, oh, I mean, God. you spent, you, you slept, I, I know you, you used to sleep on the, the blue crash mats at the, yeah. at the gym. Like, yeah. Um, it was by, it's, it was not a fairy tale. That's for sure. And, uh, that's years and years of like, yeah, I, I don't want to call it suffering. Cause it was awesome. Right. We're like, oh, you're the one of the fastest black belts in Canada ever. I'm like, yeah, man, because that's all I did all day long, every day, seven days a week. Right. It was it was never a hobby from day one. It was never a hobby. It was all in. And it comes with a lot of suffering. You know what I mean? Like I was able to progress as fast as I was, as I did, because I was fucking starving to death. And because I didn't really have a home and because I didn't have any money, like that was what I did because that's all I had. And I had to be fucking good at it. And, and I was passionate about it. And I said, I met my family through that, like M- Monkey and Tony and all, and Shaw and all, and you guys, like, but it was because that's all I had. Right. So you had to be good or you're going to fucking, you know, then you, or you're back out on, I don't want to say the street, but you kind of are going back down the same path as you were. Mm-hmm. And I still, it took me a bit to get out of the, even that destructive behavior I was, I was in when I started, it still took me a little bit to get out of it. Right. Like still struggle with stuff now. You know what I mean? Like, fuck man. And you think I don't want to sit around and smash beers all day and yeah. get into bad shit. Of course I do. That's why I can't sit still. That's why I hustle and work fucking all day, every day. And even when I don't need to, because when you're idle, then you get into bad shit. Right. Of course. Yeah. And I mean, you say it's not a fairy tale, but I mean, things, things have gone well for you, man. It's, yeah, it's, no, it's amazing I, to see. It, it, I mean, it, it was rough beginnings. Yeah. And to this day, it's still, there's still things that like, that are, that fuck me up real bad. Like I don't, I still am 40, almost 47. I still haven't accepted the fact that I'm retired. It's, I struggle with not being a fighter for a lot. And then I struggle with a lot of things. I have like serious PTSD issues and stuff like that, that, that fighting and the gym and all these things helped me bury for years and years. And now that shit's gone. So I'm like, it's all stuff I'm struggling with now. Right. So some days I'm like, man, if but I, I, 
I wouldn't have, if I didn't find fighting, I wasn't going to address any of these issues anyway. And I just would have exploded, right? So, yeah, maybe the distractions of the martial arts have put off some of these interior, like, issues that I have. But and they've given me the courage to, to face them now, you know what I mean? Where mm -hmm. I probably didn't, I didn't have when I was young. And that's why I was so destructive with a lot of the things that I did. So, yeah, man, the, I still, st like, man, I live in a nice neighborhood, a modest neighborhood. You know what I mean? I came with a Starbucks. Life's pretty good. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it's not as cool as it looks on the internet. That's for sure, right? Because I have I struggle internally with a lot of things, right? And uh, and that that yeah, martial arts was a bandage for for a lot of things, a lot of time. And but now I'm just kind of work through it, and it'll all work itself out, right? But yeah, it's uh, for for anyone who has any level of success, especially in elite, like at an elite level in sports and stuff like that, man, everyone's got a fucking dark side. I mean, you have to, I mean, I've you, never you, met you can talk about people who have had no success or yeah. like, I, I think there's a lot. Yeah. You can kind of say that for anyone, right? Like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You, yeah. You, you, people do tend to put out a better image than what things are. Right. Even, even like you're saying, if, even if you are a successful athlete or, yeah, you it's, know, uh, Anthony Bourdain killed himself. Like, Tiger Woods. Yeah, exactly. Right. Right. Everyone's, everyone's, everyone's got something. Everyone's like, got something. There's a great book. Just be should, nice to people, man. Fuck like, yeah, man. Be kind. Check out Relentless by Tim Grover. It explains a lot of things. He was Michael Jackson, uh, Michael Jackson, Michael Jordan, uh, Kobe Bryant. Like he's like all their strength coach and shit. And he'll tell you like those guys, they're all fucking crazy at something. I mean, when you get that good at something too, there's something off with you to begin right. with. Right. So you're not, you're, you're a freak athlete who is obsessed and you're just not okay with being the second best. Right, right. And I'm not even remotely, like, close to a level of athleticism or success as those guys, but, like, I get it, right? You of course. Gotta, you got to – those guys are all in. They just happen to be the greatest athlete in the world at the same time. But all that comes with a flip side. Like, Jordan's a gambler, and, like, all these guys, everyone comes with something, right? So, mm -hmm. And that's – there is a level of insanity to anyone who's really good at anything, for sure. Yeah, I mean – it's madness trying to go perfect right yeah yeah what's I, sorry no go ahead no no man. go right in i know i uh so i don't know if it's possible for what makes me successful what makes me crazy at the same time is like i'm not content with anything mm -hmm. right i'll want something and i'll go find it. i'll go figure out a way to do it and then it's done i'm like hmm. that didn't work like because to me there's still a void so i'm like oh what's that let's try that out you know what i mean like I want to fight. I want to, I want to go to Thailand. I want to run a marathon. I want to do this. I want to do that. All this shit. And then you get there and you ha and it happens and you're up on the high again. And then you just crash and then you fucking, I don't know what do you do now. Right. So, mm -hmm. yeah. But you are, I mean, you're successful with a lot of, like you have, you, you know, you've ran marathons and yeah. You, uh, I mean, you've still, you've, you've said you're, yeah, I mean, you are retired, but you've, you've competed, you know, you went to Thailand and yeah. you did uh, the, the kickboxing fight. And I just tend to do stuff big. Yeah. Like when I'm going to do something like some, like I ran my first marathon, I'm like, I'm like, let's go, let's do it in Nashville. <laughs> right. Cause it's, that sounds fun. Or like if some, I want to do a kickbox match and one of my guys, my coaches, Joven, he's like, well, you better, you should do it in Thailand. I'm like, that makes sense. It's crazy, but fuck it. Let's do it. If you're going to do a tie boxing match, let's go to Thailand. Like I just try to aim high for my own ego but I like to try to motivate other people, you know what I mean? And like, and when I do things like that, people get on board and they oh, really yeah. want to help out. Right. Cause they want to see the local guys succeed, but they know that I'm passionate about stuff. And, and I think when people jump on stuff is because they, it's their opportunity to give back to me. Cause I, I do a lot of things for a lot of people. So, and I don't, I try not to make a big deal or ask, I don't ever want anything in return. So when it's, there's an opportunity to help me out, I think people take like our jump on it. Right, because they want to be, they help me out and be part of the ride, and they want to be, mm -hmm. be see me successful. Right, so I'm really fortunate that I kind of got that backing all the time. So. Oh yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. Like I've I've seen it, and you got a you've got a great great support, uh, great crew of support behind you. Yeah, absolutely, and it comes from the wildest places, man. Like, you know, you got people from all over the world, like send you messages and vibes and or try to give you money or whatever else because you got some stupid gig like a thing dumb thing you want to try out you know what i mean mm -hmm. so it's i've been really lucky to that i got i got that and I, yeah it's not a fluke i guess you know what i mean like so well i mean you, you can get lucky being in the right place or whatever but you did the work like you know yeah. what i mean you, yeah. you know you could say like oh martial arts kind of found me it was a blessing or whatever but you still yeah you, you still, slept on the mats you yeah. got your black belt you you know yeah. you went in there and fought when i'm sure you 
probably just wanted to run away right before that bell went. It's like yeah, every time, it's, it's, it's always scary. I like the, the, I, the crazy thing I remember hearing was like Mike Tyson saying that before every fight, he thinks like the what am I doing here? Yeah, it's if if you don't get those kind of butterflies, like you're uh, it's, you're you're not right. Yeah, you shouldn't really be there. You don't really understand what kind of danger you're in. Exactly right. Like until the and when the bell rings, it's easy. Right when I when when I fight, the bell rings. I don't hear anything. Mm-hmm. It's dead quiet. And you did all the work. Yeah, weeks before, right? Yeah, you sleep you sleep like a baby the night before because you've done everything you possibly can to prepare, and then uh, and once you're in there, you're just on autopilot, right? And then you just fucking go. Um, when you did the <clears throat> when you did the kick the tie fight, mm-hmm. had you been to Thailand before? Nope. First time, right? Yeah. Amazing. <clears throat> what was that experience like? Like to do a a, a genuine <clears throat> amazing, amazing. I uh. I just really got into because I met uh, Brendan Kaljunik and and Matt Kendall and a bunch of really good kickboxers. Um, it was just something new for me to try, and it wasn't so bad on my neck. I get to smash pads, and then I jumped in a smoker one night, like on the spot. They're like, "You want to fight?" And I'm like, "Yeah, okay." So I fought someone, and then we had the opportunity where there was a show in Oshawa, so I got to jump on that. And then the, they're like, like I said, my one of my coaches and teammates sees like, "Dude, come to Thailand. I'll set it up for you because he's there most of the year." He'll, and and uh so i'm like all right i talked to the boys and said this is what i want to do and everyone's like hell yeah and i spent like six months learning how to check le- check leg kicks and then i didn't check a single leg kick <laughs> and <clears throat> it was pretty like the is it was amazing man like the beginning to end the dudes i went with and the experience of the people and being in the ring get that thrill like a real fight because you showed up you i look around I'm like i don't even know i'm fighting yeah i'm like well that's the biggest high guy here so i guess it's him right and he's a young kid and brendan's like this guy's gonna fucking try to murder you don't let him deceive you like he's a killer and it just you know and he was like seven or eight no or something like that and i was no experience but i can fight you know what i mean and that mm-hmm. kind of carries you through and i came in really good shape and i was just fucking throwing haymakers and i put him put him to sleep it worked out pretty good right so one thing i can fight better than anyone you just got to give me the rules of engagement then i'll figure out the rest from there right and you always get one warning yeah and you always get one warning right so that one i didn't need a warning it worked out pretty good i had a uh i don't think i got a warning in that fight i dropped him i think i dropped him with a left hook uppercut and then I had a nice throw because you're allowed to do certain throws. And I fucking hoisted it. I just remember, I'm like, oh, my God, this it's like throwing a child. It was just good timing. Felt he, great, yeah. he went over real high. And then then there was I clipped him with a jab cross. And then he was kind of we were kind of fighting back and forth into the corner because I was a little bit bigger and I was bullying him. And then he got kind of got stuck in the ropes. And there was like a split second of like, you probably shouldn't throw this punch. And I was like, yeah, it's too late. And I just he as he was kind of caught and turning mm-hmm. that was a crack and i knew it was a walk off because i never hit anyone that hard in my life and you just he's one lip and smash his head off the canvas and i was like holy fuck <laughs> like i won right and it was pretty it was a cool experience i never knocked anyone out ever that was my first ko yeah yeah i never like well on paper officially <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know but like that's it's, a whole it's, that's a whole another podcast it's not it's not as easy to knock someone out as you think like mm-hmm. you've taken big shots and if you give them big shots it's not that easy to lay someone of course, out yeah, yeah and uh so that was my first and it just happened to be a walk-off i'm like you know, what was fighting in thailand like was it, it it's such a different thing so to them it's like playing hockey for us yeah right like they have stadiums which are just little their boxing rings everywhere everywhere like just like arenas here like every block's got a stadium so there's a million places i'm watching these kids and they were like 10 11 years old and i'm like and their skill level is fucking insane and there's no top, there's no shin guards it's that layer you're fighting you fight for money from day one like you're that's your job right so you could be 10 11 12 years old and you're out there like at night fighting making money and it's not a big thing it sounds barbaric but it's not like when you actually, except from from North America, you that you hear that and you're like, that's disgusting. But you go see it, excuse me. You go see it and you're like, oh, I get it. That's just how life is there, and they're completely content and happy with it. And Thai boxing is just life for those guys, and it's it is pretty cool to watch how they do it. Yeah, I liked it. I just remember walking into this stadium, this bar, <laughs> and uh, it's like a tin shed with a bunch, bunch of bars around it, and just walking in, man, the smell, like blood. And like Thai liniment and just like 
I'm like, daddy is fucking home. Oh, yeah. It just, it was, I just, it was great. And it just, I didn't care. Part of the reason I performed so well is the outcome was irrelevant. Right. It wasn't fighting for the money. Yeah. I was just fighting for the love of fighting and a new experience. And I knew I was going to be loved when I got home, whether I won or lost. And I just happened to get to win. So it made it amazing. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't make or break for you. It was, no, it was just, I wanted, I wanted to go and test myself and go on an adventure and, and it was cool because not I, it wasn't my club. It wasn't the city. It was like, I felt like the whole country was like, yeah, Justin, go get it done. Here's a hundred bucks. I'm like, fuck yeah. But I got paid $30 for that fight. <laughs> and it cost me like 10,000 to do, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but it was worth it. Like everyone ran the gym for me while I trained and it just worked out really good. It's a, uh, it's cool <clears> to think <throat> about. It. It's almost a, uh, it's almost a bookend. Yeah. You know, you yeah. got 250 for the first fight and. 300 for the for the for the one in thailand 30 30 30 <laughs> sorry i added, I added and, a zero and, and uh Kavan, Kavan, <laughs> you're, going guy, down, you're going down yeah i know i was just like tanking out there just uh, but at the end it's funny because jovan like the guy who set it up like the promoter gave him the money and then he's like i gotta take off and he took off and he forgot to give it to me so i'm like i just wanted to touch it to say i did a professional <laughs> kickboxing yeah. match and he went home with it in his pocket and i was like man what are you gonna do right so it was, uh, it was pretty awesome. It was, it was just an amazing experience. I was so glad I got to get back in there and just fight for real one more time. You know, amazing. it was pretty cool. Yeah. You've had a hell of a, hell of a journey, man. I, yeah. The only thing I didn't, I've done everything. Like I did, you know, I got to do K1 rules and Thai rules and MMA and judo and Jiu Jitsu and wrestling. I did sumo wrestling. I did pancreas. I did bear. And I did, I started, I did bare knuckle before I did anything. And the only thing I didn't get to do was uh, was a, a, like a professional boxing match, right? And I, when I got home, I was like, yeah, that's next. But then it was like, I just did feel something was wrong with me. It was, and, the, and it was like depression and like bright lights and loud noises and all these things. I'm like, something's not fucking right. And then I started seeing like a concussion spe- specialist and like therapist and all this stuff. And it's like, maybe cause there's a, the crossover between the overlap between PTSD and, and TBI, like, like traumatic brain injury, like the, the common denominator, like there's so many things that are exactly the same. So you're not even sure which is which. So I was like, okay, we're going to call it a day just in case it's on, on this side of the spectrum. Sure. Right. Like, I don't want to, I haven't really thrown a punch since I came back from that trip. I just do tra- train some jujitsu here and there and that's it. Cause as much as I would have liked that hat trick to do the pro kickboxing, boxing and the MMA would have been awesome. It's just not worth it. Like I'm already difficult enough to deal with at home. Right. Let's not fucking have to spend the rest of my life eating out of a straw. Right. So uh, it is, it's all right. It's all good. I mean, it would have been nice, but like, I just count my blessings to, for all the things I actually really got to do. You can't piss a moan about the shit you missed out on. Right. So mm-hmm. it wasn't meant to be. It was, yeah. I mean, it's an amazing, um, amazing MMA journey. It, and you've, you run a school, you know, you've touched so many people's lives. Yep. Like it's, it's amazing. What's, uh, currently like, what do you, what do you, what do you, what do, you do now? Like, what do what's... I do now? So I've been very, very fortunate where, um, so my gym is closed, uh, and because of the whole COVID thing and we were just tanked out and it just wasn't worth, I just didn't have the fight in me anymore. Like the other kids, the other guys in my circle to keep it going. And it was actually them. They're like, dude, you've, you put your time in we're all good. Like we'll take it from here. And I was like, all right. And <clears throat> I closed shop. Uh, I'm still very fortunate that like, I'm still in charge of, of all the gyms around here. All their black belts are from me. Mm-hmm. So I'm still kind of get to oversee all the jujitsu. I'm still the head coach, MMA coach for all the gyms. Right. So I still get to be a part of all the training and the traveling and stuff like that. So right now I teach, like I just do personal sessions, like private lessons. Uh, I I just, so just last week, uh, I did an entire week of filming with a buddy of mine. His name's Robin Black. He works for uh, TSN and Bellator. He's mm-hmm. just a, all around, and he's, he's an analyst. He's a good friend of mine. So we came up with a project. He's been a blue belt for 12 years. So we came up with this pro- project where like to get him to purple belt. He's the guy's a career martial artist. Yeah. Oh a, yeah. Oh you yeah. Know what I mean, I'm, he knows oh, yeah. so much about it. It was just a matter of like, let's do some shit and we documented everything. So we, um, so we had a camera crew, crew come in and shoot everything. It's just being edited for right now. And what was cool is I've also right now they're shooting a documentary on me and Robin actually happens to be like, I think executive producer or some sort of 
for that project as well. So they can, they're using some of the footage we shot will be used for that. And then, so the last half of the week was, uh, was just sitting down with, uh, with production and doing like all preliminary stuff. So last week was, I sit with the camera crew, pretty cool, like full setup. And then, uh, you know, they break down like kind of why'd you get into this and what the story of your childhood and all these things. And they have a writer in the room and now they build the storyboard and then they come back and they shoot more footage later, interview different fighters and athletes and coaches and people like, and then they just put it all together. And then there's a movie about me. So, and then, well, and then we'll take it from there and see what happens Mm -hmm. with it. Uh, Maybe it turns into something bigger. You know what I mean? Who knows? It's a fun process. And it's like, for me, it's like, uh, it's therapeutic for me to talk about my past to other people because I, if I speak at a lot of like the boys and girls club and the, and uh, sometimes like at the alternative alternative schools and sometimes at the jails and stuff like that. So I'm, and my, I know my story helps people out. So if, <clears throat> if I can do that on a, on a larger platform and help more people, then that's what I want to do. And, and I like this part, like I like being on the mic and I like being on the camera and I like being the, the I like the really like the performing part that I've learned how to do over my career. Cause usually you're performing in front of the group you're teaching, but now with social media and podcasting and everything else, I'm like, I get to do this all the time. Right. Mm-hmm. It's fun. I really enjoy that part. So I'm happy that we got a couple projects that hopefully turn into, um, you know, uh, something bigger and we could take it from there. Uh, I'd like to get back in maybe into podcasting. Eventually um, my partner went in a different direction for now. And, uh, <clears throat> but who knows? I'm like, because the connections and the path the weird path have been opportunities just keep popping up and uh everything comes up justin yeah everything just coming up justin and on top of that i'm uh i've uh i'm i'm opening a new business that uh right here in whitby just down the street from you so can we can i'll do it i got permission from uh from the home homies last night to to uh i i was approached with an opportunity probably six months ago and said what would you think about opening a, um, a laser tattoo removal clinic? And I was like, really? And I thought of, I'm like, I, and really I didn't even blink. I was like, fuck yeah, I'll do that. Mm-hmm. Like I knew I was going to need a job. And I really started to think about that because I've had, I, like I've had a tattoo removed now and it's, it's shitty. It's extremely painful and whatever else, but you, I still, I'm like, that'd be a great job because the money will be okay. I don't have to physically cripple myself anymore. And you're in a position where I can be social as I want throughout the day. And I can help you erase a part of your history that you don't want or something that you don't want anymore. I could take off your, like someone's, you know, your ex-boyfriend's fucking name or something that happened to you or a bad experience or just something that's you're uncomfortable. Like you've got this tattoo or whatever on you that's making you self-conscious and about yourself or something that, you know, you're uncomfortable with. And I can take that away from you and make you feel better about yourself. I'm like, that's a fucking great job. Hell yeah. So, uh, and I've, I've already been removing tattoos. So we're all set up. Uh, the name of our, uh, our business is, unwanted <laughs> yeah and uh it, literally just down the street brock and mary i'll That's be your, awesome, i'll be man. able to be your neighbor and i just like i said i was just provided the opportunity by some really really fucking awesome friends uh that i trust more than anything and they they were like they kind of needed someone they could trust and and they know how you know i'm good with people and also you when you have me up there as you're kind of i want well i don't want to say spokesperson but I'm like i'm telling you it's okay to get a tattoo removed when i fucking look like this they must be okay to get a tattoo removed and that's like just the thought of being able to help people it's like the it's on a different level but it just really appealed to me and i'm like hell yeah i'll do that and st- that will still allow me to coach and travel and train whatever else but you just kind of a have a new day job a new career right where where i was really scared when the gym was closing wasn't that i had to get i I, w- I don't want to work a job. I want to have a career, right? That's what was cool. Mine was never a job. It was a career. It's different, mm-hmm. right? So now I've uh, these, you know, I got these friends that are just, you know, you hand him, you give a man a fish, he eats for a day. You teach a man to fish, you know, he'll eat his whole life. And that's the opportunity these guys are giving to me, man. They're like, let's try this out. Let's do it together. And I'm like, fuck yeah, man, without a doubt. 
So that's going to be what I do for a while. Hell yeah, man. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm happy you're coming to the neighborhood. Yeah, man. It's bring some cards, but you know, we'll, we'll put them out. <laughs> yeah. The, hey man, we live in a world of bad fucking tattoos. I was going to say there's a, in, a, in, in the Oshawa area, you're yeah. gonna, you'll have some potential clients. That's a, that's an industry that's changed so much and, and that it's everywhere. And, and it's, uh, it's not taboo to get a tattoo removed anymore. Mm-hmm. And you, tattoos are no longer a permanent thing because they're so fashionable. Like when I've got my first tattoo, I was, I was like the devil. I was, I was very young and I was a teenager and everyone was like, what the fuck, man? Like no one in my hometown had a tattoo. Now it's like, I don't know anyone without a tattoo. Yeah. Honestly. Right? So, and now, and I, you know, I want to put it out. It's okay to go get, get shit erased now. It's no big deal. Whether it's because you want to lose that memory or you want to get a new piece of art or whatever, who gives a shit? Right. Come see me. Love it. Unwanted. You <laughs> Unwanted. guys make sure you check it out. Yeah. Yeah. On, uh, on un- what? I think it's a, uh, what is it? Unwanted L LTR on uh, Instagram. Cool. We'll, we'll make sure we put up the socials. Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll tag it in that. And yeah. uh, that's awesome, man. Congratulations. It's great to see you on the next chapter. Yeah. I'm, I'm life. Can, life's pretty weird. Life is and, pretty uh, weird. I, I do, I do some, I visit some dark places in my brain. But overall, man, I really enjoy the ride that I'm on, and uh, it's it's this is the best, man. I'm I'm a very fortunate person to have gone down this weird fucking path and have all these things happen to me, and uh, and and just yeah, man, it's amazing. So it's um, absolutely, I uh, I appreciate being a, a small part of your journey too. Uh, you're bigger than bigger part than you think, man. Like I said earlier, without you and your family, there's I wouldn't end up in this position, right? It's, so. It's been amazing. The uh, the Justin Bruckman biopics coming out. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Hey, the, who who knows where it, where where it all to go? But there's some some weird footage footage and interviews me out there <laughs> now. So when it gets um when the story gets adapted for uh for a major Hollywood release, who's who's playing you? Um, Jason Statham's <laughs> love child. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I fuck i don't know man I think we'll uh we'll work. maybe i'll play myself who knows perfect yeah well, actually or, or, or i'll be in, i'll be like stan lee right where you just pop up <laughs> for a while cameo. in your own yeah cameos in my own bio yeah that would be the plan oh man that's so. great yeah <clears throat> awesome dude this is uh, this has been a ton of fun um it flies by, eh? It really does. Is there yeah. any, is there anything else you want to touch on? I don't want to. I don't want to keep you here too long. I know you're no, you're no, a busy I, guy. no. I honestly, I, I just, what I guess you, you kind of run through your stereotypical list of thank yous and stuff like that. But you know, I've got, man, I really do have the coolest life, and my life is possible because I have a family that loves me, a wife that supports fucking every decision I make, whether. It's, she agree, agrees in it or not. And I have amazing friends and family. I've, you know what I mean? And I have a, I have a city that treats me like I'm the fucking mayor and I have sponsors like a vintage speed metal and, and unwanted and some people like sinful and all these guys that have backed me up so mm-hmm. much over my life. And, and, uh, I just, I'm just really fortunate. And the whole, I'm, uh, something to, goes back to something I said earlier about being accountable, man. There was an off, there was a point in my life when, because of the childhood and the teen years that I had, I was angry, and that's why kind of why I got into fighting. And you're angry because that you believe that you're a victim, right? And uh, and we live in this world too that we have that victim mentality. Everyone's woe is me, and everyone wants kind of wants attention and, or it's sympathy and whatever else. I'm like, that's not really how it roll, man. So at one point in my my life. Uh, um, I, I decided there is no longer, I'm going to, I can't blame my life on being a victim. I have to be a survivor. Right. And, uh, I never knew how to phrase it and how to put it until I actually met brother Ali. And he said, and he said, he's like, you can, he's like, you can be a victim or you can be a fucking survivor. And he's like, the choice is up to you. And I was like, that's what it is. And when I stopped blaming the world for my problems and acting like a victim, and I decided that uh, I'm a survivor of all the things that happened to me, my life turned around and became awesome. So my message is always going to be every time I speak, whether it's on the mic in front of a group, doesn't matter what happens to you in your life and how horrible it is. Like, there's two ways to look at it, man. You can be a victim or you can survive or get the fuck up to get up and do cool shit with your life. And that's it, man. That's all I got to say. Love it. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I don't. I think we should wrap it up. Yeah. Then, man. I don't know where we go after that. That, that, usually, was, that usually does it. That was beautiful. <laughs> um, this is uh, Gavin with Gavin. This is episode four. I wanted to thank my my guest Justin Bruckman for coming in today, man. 
Um, great talk, dude. Thank you for sharing that with everybody, your yeah, journey. And- absolutely. Uh, we'll, and we will, I'm really happy you got this up and going. It's such a fun thing and I look forward to seeing where you take it and I can't wait uh, to knock off a couple more adventures so I can come back and tell you all about oh, them. Yeah, man. Yeah. Thank you for everything. Thank you.